Um, thanks very much. Uh, again, my name is Dan Driscoll. I'm a senior developer at Microsoft Research Fuse Labs, and I'm going to tell you all about the bot framework today. Um, I'm guessing most of you saw the keynote, but if you haven't, um, I'll let you know that we've launched a brand new product, brand new platform called the Bot Framework that allows you to build your own bots, connected and intelligent bots. Um, how good with title slides? There we go. All right, this session, we have an hour long session today, and we're going to talk all about how to make a bot. Um, we're going to give you, uh, we're going to show you what it looks like in code. We're going to go all the way from having no code at all through having a, a functional bot that's working in the bot framework. So we're going to show you all those pieces. Um, but before we get started on that, you know, before we start really working on uh, this phrase on the left, I want to talk a little bit about the phrase on the right, right? Not how do you make a bot, but how do you make a bot great? Um, I guess uh, the first question that comes to my mind is, is when, when I look at this is what actually is a bot? Um, I, I'm sure we can think of many examples of bots that we've seen already. Uh, Cortana, Siri, Howdy.ai is a stand-up bot. It's really great. Um, uh, simple text-based adventure game bots. Uh, there are a ton of bots that are out there. And they all have very different interaction styles. And so when you think about what you would maybe build on the bot framework, uh, you may ask yourself, what is the experience that I want? What is going to make a bot that works really great for users? Now, I was talking with Amir over at Slack uh, earlier this week, and he had a really great observation when we were talking about this, this, uh, this question. He observed that some of the best bots out there make you feel, you as the user, makes you feel like a director, that you have assistance. And instead of having to do the work yourself, you can simply point your assistance to that job and say, hey, please do this thing for me. So you can have a bot that will go and look at your server's uptime. You don't actually have to log into the machine or remote or do anything and look at any web pages. You just say, hey, please tell me this information. Those bots can also do things on your behalf. Please book a flight. Please coordinate with this other person. Please fix the permissions on the documents that are shared in this thread so that everyone can see them. Um, this, I think, is a really great way to think about the very best bots. And when you build bots, I think it would be great the, to think about um, how you would build those kinds of features into, your, into the bots you build. Um, this definition, too, I think helps us open our minds a lot. It helps us open our minds to what bots can do, the kinds of things that they can accomplish, not just simple slash commands and not just you know, exposing existing APIs, but really enabling new multi-step operations within a conversation. So conversation has this really unique um, characteristic that uh, in a conversational statement, I can include a whole lot of information that would take me many, uh, many steps to uh, uh, operate a, on a web page. So for instance, I can say, please book me a flight from San Francisco to Los Angeles on Thursday. And within that, I've got five or six different fields in a web page. Uh, I have a couple of page navigations built into it. And yet, when I, when I hand that statement off to my assistant, my bot, um, they have all the information they need to create, you know, create the request on, uh, at once. I think it also opens our minds a little bit to where a bot can be. Uh, those of you who saw the keynote saw that we had a Weston bot that was embedded in Skype. Now, the Weston bot came in and helped, um, uh, helped Lillian book a room within an existing conversation. And text, has this, text and conversations have this other really great characteristic in that they are highly portable. So you're not bound by the user interfaces that you started with. It's not a desktop application. It's not a mobile application that's stuck on that device. Um, it can flow through the various systems that your users already use, existing conversations, new conversations on platforms that they find to be convenient. If it's helpful to text your assistant, then it'll be helpful to be able to just text your bot. And we think that this is one of the things that will drive people to use bots more and more. Now, the availability of these bots on these platforms is really what's going to push the, plat the bots forward. So the Weston bot is an example of something that will help move people to expect that bots and services will be available within their existing conversations. You know, ultimately, we expect the conversation is going to be integral to all of the, the brands and experiences that you have. And those conversations are going to flow directly to the users where they are. You're not going to have to install an app. You're not going to have to install, go to a web page. You can just connect directly with the, the brand or product uh, uh, where, where you are. So as we begin the session and we really get into the nitty gritty of, of building a bot, I want you to think about how you would build really great bots uh, with these characteristics. What are the problems that you want to solve in your businesses? What do your products do already? 
Um, what are the features you would enable? Because if you have these things in mind, I think you'll get a lot more from the session. You'll be thinking about the problems that you actually face. You'll be thinking about the ways that your customers expect your product to work. Um, and I think that'll, that'll help you absorb a whole lot more in, uh, in the session when we talk about the bot framework. So, um, okay, enough of all of that. Uh, let's get back to the left side, which is actually how do we build this bot that we want to have exist? Um, I mentioned earlier we've launched the bot framework. Uh, just to give you a high level, like a 100,000 foot level overview, um, uh, the bot framework is a Microsoft operated service, which we call the bot connector, and it's an SDK. I'm gonna tell you more about those in a minute. But that's, that's really the, the core of the bot framework. But if you're looking to build a bot, you're probably gonna use more than just the service and the SDK. You're going to use many services, services to host your bot, services for natural language and machine learning use if you'd like to uh, incorporate that, um, services for image processing if those are the kinds of features you want. And so we think of the bot framework as one of many tools and many tools that Microsoft offers uh, to build a fantastic bot. So some of these others, like I mentioned, and we're gonna talk about uh, the language understanding and intelligence service, uh, Lewis, in this, in this session, we're actually gonna use it. Uh, but there are speech APIs, there are Azure, there are a whole lot more. Okay, so that's at the 100,000 foot level. Let's go down uh, one step to the 10,000 foot level uh, to explain what a bot actually is. Uh, so uh, let's, say, let's, take, let's take a couple of examples here. Let's say that you're building, you wanna build a tic-tac-toe bot. Um, and it'll be a really great tic-tac-toe bot, but the very core of the bot is going to be logic that allows someone to play the game tic-tac-toe. Um, that logic is something that exists within your product, or it exists within, uh, it, it's in your hands already, and that's not, not something that we're going to define for you. You're gonna have that logic, you're gonna know what makes sense for your customers. Um, it could also be, the logic could also be something that connects to a web service. So we have a web service on this diagram just to indicate that the logic inside your bot may rely on external services. The Domino's Pizza Bot relied on an external service. You know, internally, it put together the, the, this pizza, um, and then it sent it off to the, the Domino's REST API. But this is all your code. Now, if we wanna turn this into a bot, we need the ability for a user to send a message to it and the bot to respond back with whatever its response is. And if you're building a really simple bot, you can add your own conversational logic into what we're gonna call your bot. So uh, in the pizza bot example I showed you, this pizza bot that ordered this pizza only accepted one command, really, and that was slash order. And I just coded that on my own. That was my own conversational logic. Uh, the bot didn't really do very much, but it really was a bot because it could receive a text string, do some work, and then return a text string back. Um, now, uh, this is fine for simple bots, but interesting bots need a whole lot more complexity, and especially if you're trying to do any sort of multi-step navigation, or you wanna collect data from someone, or you're doing something that requires um, you know, permission, which of course we like to do when we, when we actually order someone a pizza, um, you probably will find that uh, writing that conversation on your own gets to be really cumbersome. The code to manage dialogue state, um, conversation state, can become really complex. And so the first component of the bot framework is, is something I'm gonna uh, show you here, the bot builder SDK, uh, which you would use inside of your bot to replace whatever your basic conversational logic is. Um, and that bot builder SDK does all of the work in managing the conversation state for you. So uh, this is a, this is a, um, uh, it's a node.js library or C-sharp DLL that you load within your bot and you configure it, you give it a couple, uh, a couple of settings and then it does all the work of walking your user through the steps that you want to walk them through. Uh, if you want to add natural language processing and machine learning skills, uh, the Bot Builder SDK integrates very cleanly with the language understanding intelligence service, uh, Lewis. Uh, and so um, that's, a great, that's a great feature that you can use. Uh, okay, so at this point we have our bot. Um, our bot has dialogue smarts, it can do natural language processing, um, but it doesn't talk to anyone. Uh, the strings that it receives and returns are all just contained within this little diagram that we've got. So now we wanna actually connect it up. And this is where the second half of the bot, bot framework comes in. So the other part that, I, that we're gonna show is the bot connector. And the bot connector is an online service that connects your bot seamlessly to the services on the right-hand side of the frame. Uh, services like uh, Skype, Slack, Telegram, SMS, GroupMe. Um, we have a lot of services that we offer. And uh, by implementing one simple REST API interface in your bot, you get access to all of these different channels. Um, the send and receive to your bot is just a simple webhook call. So your bot simply has to be available on the internet. And if you've coded your own bot in a language other than Node.js and C-sharp, as long as you talk our REST API message format, we'll, we'll use your bot. We've designed this as an open platform and all the pieces are pluggable. So if, you, uh, if you've written your bot on your own and you wanna use it with a bot connector and you're not using the bot builder, that's totally cool. 
Just implement our, our interface and register it, and your bot will start talking. In addition to sending and receiving messages, which are kind of the two core functions that the bot connector performs, it has a bunch of additional features, and I'll mention these briefly, but we'll show them more uh, later on. Uh, the first of these is the ability to store state. So if you're trying to keep track of where a user is in a dialogue, whether they've said yes or no to an answer, or if you're letting our bot builder SDK manage that for you, the bot connector provides storage within the service for your bot to store its conversational state. It also gives, it provides translation services. This is an optional uh, service that you can turn on, um, and your bot's messages will be translated to and from your user's native language uh, into your bot's, whatever you've coded your bot in. Uh, we use Bing translation technology to make this happen, uh, and it can be really great to expose your bot in other languages um, and to, to new users. Uh, we also have telemetry. We have service level telemetry that we log, so if you have an App Insights container, we can log telemetry about your bot directly to that Im App Insights container. Uh, you'll probably want to have your own service level telemetry as well, but uh, we provide, um, your, sorry, your own application level telemetry, but we provide information about how long your bot is operating, or how long each of the calls to your bot take, um, whether you have any failure calls, and this, uh, failure, um, um, uh, failure messages when you, we call your bot. And this can be really handy when you're trying to uh, debug your bot. Okay, I think actually it's really easy to understand all of this when we actually look at a message. Uh, so here's one example JSON message that was sent between the bot connector and your bot. Um, I'm gonna run through, I've only left some interesting fields in here. I've actually taken a lot out, out so this is not a complete message. Um, but I'll run through at the top from the top. Um, first, uh, the message that was sent, uh, in this case to your bot from a user, is a message message. And so we have a number of different message types within the bot framework. Uh, message is one of them, but we also have system messages uh, to, uh, to inform your bot that, for instance, a user has left or joined the conversation. Um, we can also, uh, we also send information about when your bot has left or joined a conversation, um, and we may have more system messages over time. Uh, next, we have a message ID, and the message ID is useful if you want to reply to a message that was, um, uh, if you want to reply specifically to a message, which can be really handy when you have um, uh, uh, conversations that take multiple paths, like email. Uh, so if a user says something, you may want to respond specifically to that email and not necessarily to the way, the way that the email thread has diverged over time. Next, we have a conversation ID, which allows your bot to correlate all the traffic across one conversation. We have the language that we think the user um, specified, uh, the, the language that the user used when they, uh, when they gave us their, uh, their input text. Um, and the, the, we provide facilities for the user to customize and say, hey, I speak French. Uh, and then we uh, start treating their language as French and translate it into whatever you'd like. Um, we have a set of attachment fields, which can be binary attachments. We provide you URLs, but they can be images, documents, and so forth. And then we give you the, uh, the ad uh, addressing information of the user. Um, what we don't want to do in the bot framework is we don't want to paper over all the services that you're using so that you don't get the information you would get from them as if you were using them directly. So we're providing you with the actual SMS number that you would get if you were using a service like Twilio. Um, we don't hide that. We don't cover it up with our own user ID. We do give you a user ID um, that we track internally inside the bot framework, but um, this number is, is something that you would get if you were using that service directly. Uh, and then skipping down to the bottom two fields, uh, we have uh, a way to pass through high fidelity information specific to each channel. So if you're communicating over um, Skype, for instance, um, Skype supports some additional, um, additional items within their API uh, that uh, may be available in this channel data field that you can use to talk the high fidelity Skype language uh, even though your, uh, your bot um, just has basic text things to say back and forth. So uh, if you're interested in using those, those extra features, the chan channel data field is the way that we wire those through. Uh, and lastly, we have the bot user data, which is that state that we talked about earlier. And this is just an async state that you can put information in, and the data goes back and forth, and the bot connector manages that, the lifetime of that state for you. Okay, so uh, at this point, this is, uh, this is all I'm gonna show you on the, on the messages. I think it'll be a little bit clearer, too, when we look at some of the code. Um, and so to walk you through the process of a new bot, uh, I'm gonna welcome on stage uh, Mike Hall, who's a, uh, a principal architect in Microsoft Research. Welcome, Mike. Hi, everybody. And, and we're gonna go through each of the steps that you see here. We're gonna blast through these as, as quickly as we can. We're gonna start with just a bare Visual Studio template, which is available on the botframework.com website. And then we're gonna go through each of the steps of um, creating a simple bot, in this case, a simple stock bot, um, adding in uh, natural language processing, and so forth. We'll go through these one by one. Okay, who wants to build a bot? 
Okay, who wants to build a bot? <laughs> <laughs> Great. Okay, so I'm in Visual Studio 2015. I'm going to create a new project. We've already got the SDK installed, so I've got the template for building this new bot application here. I'm going to give this a name, as Dan mentioned, of Stockbot. Uh, we're going to build a bot over a number of different levels to allow you to query various stocks and potentially even get to the level of uh, buying or selling stock. OK, so I'm going to hit Next, and that will generate the application. There are a few things to point out about the default template application that's just been generated or is actually being generated. So the first thing is that the bot itself is going to be hosted somewhere on the internet so that the bot connector can send and receive messages from your bot. So we need to be able to secure the channel between your bot and the bot connector. The way in which we do this is through this file called webconfig, where we have the app ID and app secret for your bot. What I'm going to do is give this uh, an app ID of uh, your app ID one and your app secret one. When I develop the bot, build it, deploy it, uh, use this bot, initially I'm just going to be using this on my PC, and I'm going to be talking to it through a device emulator, which is emulating uh, messaging between a user and the bot. When we get to publish this, in this case up to Azure, we will need obviously a more secure app ID and app key, and Dan will walk us through that process in just a few minutes. OK, so that's the web config modified. The other file to take a look at here is this default.htm file. This has some basic data in it saying, you know, describe your bot and so on. Again, if your bot is public on live internet, that means that it's on a reachable IP address and somebody could potentially browse there. And so you want to give some information to that person about your bot usage, you know, terms and conditions, and so on. And if, if you want your uh, customers, when they land on that page, to actually use your bot, this is a place where you can embed the bot connector's uh, web chat control, which I showed briefly in the keynote demo. I don't know that we're going to have time to go over it today, but you can drop that in there. Yeah, probably not. But yes, good point. <laughs> OK, so now let's get into the code itself. So the template produces the main entry point for your bot application. And that's this function here, which is the post function. You can see that this returns a message, and it takes in a message. And Dan briefly showed you a couple of seconds ago the message format. So there are a number of interesting things within that message, one of which is the message type, and, and obviously things like message text, which will be the text that the user has sent to your bot for you to do some work on. So what we can see within the default application is if the message type is message, which means this is the text that a user has sent to your bot, what we're going to do is just calculate the length of the string that the user has sent you. And then we're going to create a reply message saying, your string is this long. OK, does that make sense? Fairly straightforward, right? You get a message in, you process the message, you generate a reply message, you send the message back. So that's pretty straightforward. That's the standard message. But as Dan mentioned, there's also this notion of system messages. And so there are a number of messages that can be delivered, not necessarily from a user-initiated message, but in this case, for things like a bot being ad added to an application or leaving a, a, a conversation or leaving a conversation, a user being added, a user leaving, or a conversation ending. So the default template gives you the handler here called handle system message with a number of these uh, uh, messages kind of handled but without any actual return. So let's, in our case, uh, hook up one of these messages, and I'm going to use the bot added to conversation message. So what I'm going to return here is message. Remember, we've already seen this in the default template code. We take in a message, and we can use that message to create the reply message with the text that we want to send back. So I'm going to say create reply message, and because this is coming from a bot, added to the conversation rather than a human, I'm going to say, hello, Botty McBotface. <laughs> only, only seems appropriate, right? <laughs> OK, so I'm not going to make any additional changes. I'm going to build this. I'm going to run this. And what's going to happen is this is going to get deployed. IIS Express is running on the local machine. Uh, we'll see the default page for 
the bot getting launched. And so now the bot is active, actively running. I've got the emulator already running here. Uh, this gives me the ability to test not only system messages, but user messages into the bot so we can try out some of these things. The first thing to notice is the top left-hand side, the IP address of the bot is localhost, here's the port, and then the path to the, uh, the message handler within, within the bot. I also have my app ID and my app secret. Uh, since the bot could be deployed into Azure, that means it's on a, a public site. I'd obviously want to change the URI to the bot and also the app secrets to match the real app secrets in my deployed bot. I can, I've got a drop down here where I can send a system message. So let's go ahead and send a system message uh, for bot added to conversation. And then we see straight away we get the message back, hello, Botty McBotface. Amazing. <laughs> what, what, is the, uh, what is going on on the right pane there? Ah, OK. So on the left-hand side, we see what the user would see as part of the conversation. On the right-hand side, what we're seeing is a breakdown of that message format that you displayed up on the slide a couple of minutes ago. Right? So if you're uh, wanting to debug your bot and have a look at the uh, messages being sat, sent backwards and forwards in its raw form, you can just take a direct look at the JSON that's shown on the right-hand side. Obviously, we want to send a real message to the bot, so I'm going to type, hello world, hit enter, and I sent 11 characters to the bot. Isn't that amazing? Yes. Okay. But you're probably asking yourself, hey, so what does this have to do with the stock bot? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so let's go ahead and add some additional functionality into the bot. I'm going to add a new class. I'm going to call this Yahoo. We're going to be using the Yahoo Web API to go and look up a stock, right? So I'm now going to type in some code to uh, call into that Yahoo uh, web service. You're such a fast typer. Uh, it has been said before. <laughs> OK, so this is really straightforward, right? This is just using web client. You can see the URI. Uh, the way in which this works is it's going to be returning a double uh, out of uh, the, the call to the Yahoo stock service. And uh, if the stock is real, we get the value. And if it's not real, we get null return on the double. OK, so I don't need to do anything else into the Yahoo class. If I come back into my application, what I'm going to do is add in a little bit of extra code here for this function called getStock. And what this is going to do is call that Yahoo uh, web service. And if I get null for the return, meaning it's not a valid ticker, then I'm going to return a message saying the stock doesn't appear to be valid, or I'm going to return the stock in the current value. OK, so you know, fairly straightforward. The only other thing that I need to change is to go up to our message handler and put in some kind of string return to call the getStock function and then return that data back to the user. So I'm going to say string str stock equals await get stock and pass in message. This is the inbound message from the user dot text, which is the text that we get from the user calling our our uh, bot. So the next thing I'm going to do is replace the, what we have was you sent so many characters with uh, str stock. So that's all the changes I need to make to the bot <clears throat> to be able to call out to the Yahoo service, get the data back, and then respond back to the user. So I'm going to build that, build succeeds, launch that. We get the web page being displayed as before. And then I should be able to go back to the emulator and give it a stock. So I'm going to start with my favorite uh, ticker name. Um, and that doesn't appear to be valid, right? So uh, I can obviously choose something else like Microsoft, and I get the, the stock value back. OK, so great, fantastic. That's looking a lot more like a stock bot. I, I think you would agree. Yes. But wait, there's more. <laughs> so now what we're going to do, I mean, what we've seen so far is we built a basic bot. We're calling out to a Yahoo web service. We're getting some data back, and, and we're returning that back to the user. But it's not very conversational yet, right? I, as the user, had to understand that the thing I give it is a ticker name, and I get a response back. Wouldn't it be much better for me to be able to type a message or a string that says something like, what is the current value of Microsoft stock, right? So one of the things that Dan talked about earlier is the Language Understanding Intelligence Service, or LEWIS. So why don't we now use LEWIS to in integrate some 
natural language processing into this application. Okay, so I'm gonna minimize Visual Studio for a second and the emulator. I'm going to go to Lewis and I've already got a model that is built out in Lewis that we'll take a look at that shows us how we can deal with, uh, in this case, a, a, a stock model. So here's the stock model, and when we think about Lewis, there are two things that we're interested in, one of which is intents, and that is what I want to do. So you can think of an intent being, uh, get me the value of a stock, or buy some stock, or show me the last stock that I was interested in, or potentially something like, is the market up or down? That would be the intent. And then we also have entities. So in the case of requesting a certain type of stock, show me the value of Microsoft stock, in that case, the entity would be Microsoft. That's the thing that we're interested in looking for, right? So I've got a number of, of uh, uh, an, an amount of data that's already built into this thing. You can see when I bring this up, there is extensive training that has gone into this model. We have about four items in the list, right? <laughs> uh, and you can see that I can ask a number of things. Tell me the price of Tesla. What is the price of Tesla? Show me the price for Microsoft. What is Apple at today? Those, those kind of things, right? So that would be the kind of thing that I would expect the user to send. And then from that, I can get the intent, which is show me the stock value and the entity, which would be Tesla, Microsoft, Apple, or whatever it's going to be. OK, so that's pretty neat. So I can do a number of things. I can modify this and publish it. If I click on the publish link, you can see the URL, the URI for the service. I can also put in some, uh, some basic query. So show me uh, Microsoft, for example. And if I click the link, that'll return the result of calling into that Lewis model with the text that I've just entered. So what we can see here is the intents. Hopefully, you can see this. The intents at the top of the screen showing stock price is the best hit. And then at the bottom, we have the entities showing Microsoft as the symbol that we're interested in, all right? So one of the neat things that we can do is just grab all of that JSON that we get back from the Lewis model. We can then come into Visual Studio, right click, add a new class. I'm gonna call this Lewis. And then if I just delete this placeholder, I can come to the edit menu, paste special, paste JSON as classes, which would just generate all the class information for me directly. So that's pretty neat, right? We didn't even build that. This is just a thing that's been built into Visual Studio. However, <laughs> thanks for the applause. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> OK, so I've just replaced the, the uh, paste with some additional code. There's a function here, parse user input. So what this is going to do is call out to that Lewis model uh, using an HTTP call, and then return the results back. And what we're going to get back is uh, a class that contains the uh, intent and entities for making that call. Great. So that's the Lewis piece done. So I'm going to close that down. I'm going to come back to our application code. So here's our post function. You can see here's our if message which is currently just getting the raw stock name like Microsoft or uh, Tesla or whatever. So I'm gonna replace this with slightly more code. And what we'll do is just take a walk through of what's happening inside of this code. So as before, we're checking the message type. Is this a message from a user? Yes, it is. We'll come back to this thing, set stock false in a second. One of the things that Dan mentioned earlier is that we have the ability to persist data across messages into your bot. Your bot is, in effect, stateless, right? It's an HTTP endpoint. So when you receive a message, ah, thanks. Uh, when you receive a message, uh, that, that message would obviously contain uh, some text. And what we might want to do is, is, in effect, have a rolling conversation. So I might want to ask, in this case, uh, what is Microsoft stock at? And then later on, I might want to ask, well, how about now? What's it at now? So I want to be able to get that last intent out of the system so I can persist that. So what I'm saying here is set stock is false. We'll come back to why I'm doing that in a second. So here's the call into Lewis. I get the uh, stock Lewis class back. And I'm setting up now ready to uh, provide the return text back to the user. 
So I'm checking the intents, the number of intents that I get back from Lewis. If it's zero, then I'm going to reply to the user saying, I'm sorry, I don't understand what you're asking. Otherwise, I'm going to switch on the uh, zero element of the intents, the one that has the highest ranking out of the input for the user, and then do something based on that. So one of the intents that we saw when we went to the Lewis site was the intent for repeat last stock. So if I've just asked for Microsoft stock, five minutes later, I might ask, well, how about now? What's it at now? So that would be my intent to repeat the last stock. What we're doing on the next line is we're making a call on message to get bot user data of type string and then last stock. You can think of this as a property bag based on the message. So I have the ability in this case to query the message for, in this case, last stock in the property bag of the message to return me a string, which will be the last stock name that I searched on. Does that make sense? Great. So if there isn't anything in the property bag, I can then simply return a message saying, I don't have a previous stock to look at. If I do have something, then I can obviously just go ahead and make a call back to the same stock, get stock function that we saw a couple of minutes ago, which will return me the current value for that stock, and then obviously I can uh, push that out to the user. If the intent is stock price, then I set the flag to say, yes, I want to set the stock, and we'll see exactly why we're doing that in a second. And then I make a call to the get stock function, which would obviously give me the string to return to the user. Now, what we've seen before is we, we had this return message.create reply message. In this case, what I'm doing is, is pulling out the reply message specifically. So I'm saying message, reply message equals message.create reply message, and obviously passing in the string that we want to reply. But the reason why I'm calling that out rather than just returning the message is because I want to set the property in the property bag if the flag has been set to store the stock, right? So I'm saying if set stock, then on the reply message, set the bot user data in the property bag for this thing called last stock, and then the, uh, the entity that we just queried to return to the user. And then we re return with the message. And the rest of the code is exactly as we've seen it before. If it's not a user-initiated message, it must be a system message, so we handle that in the same way. Okay, everyone happy with that? Great. So let's build this, and that builds quite happily. I'm gonna deploy it. So obviously once we see the, uh, the web page up, we know that everything's running. I can then come over to the emulator and I can say, show me Microsoft. And that returns me the value of Microsoft stock. So now we have not only the ability to just give it a stock directly, but now I can start to give it natural language capabilities by asking in this case, show me Microsoft stock. Right? So that's pretty cool. The other intent that we had was, well, you know, show me the stock now. And I can ask things like, how about now? And of course, we stored that Microsoft stock ticker into the property bag. So now I get this new message coming in. I can obviously query the property bag, pull out the Microsoft stock ticker, query it, and then return that back to the user. All right? So what you've seen just in the last couple of minutes is the ability to easily integrate Lewis directly into your bot application to add natural language understanding, but also the ability to persist data across messages from your stateless bot. So that's pretty neat. Okay, Dan, I think the next thing that we need to do is get this thing published. That's right. Okay, and, uh, yeah. so why don't you walk us through that part of it? And then once you've done that, mm -hmm. I'll come back and, and we'll uh, add some more code. Absolutely. So uh, if we could just flip uh, really quickly back to, where's the button to flip us back to the, the to slide? the slides. Right? Yes. You've got it. Good, perfect. Um, so we've gone through, we started from a Visual Studio template and having no code. We built a simple stock bot. We've added Lewis. And now we have to publish our bot so it's available to users, connect it up to those users, and then I'm going to hand it back to Mike to uh, finish up with some dialogue smarts. Is it six right here? Six. Yep. Perfect. Um, now, the Microsoft Bot framework is an open platform. And it's a system that allows you to bring your own tools, bring your own bot, bring your own really whatever you like. And we have other tools and resources that can be integrated so that you can build a complete bot. 
Um, and if you have your own hosting already, you can use your own hosting. If you want to host your bot on AWS or in your own data center or in Azure, all of those are okay. All we need is the endpoint. Uh, but in this case, it turns out that the Azure free trial has more than enough space for us to run our bot. And so we're going to show you how to use uh, Azure to host your bot and hook it up to the bot framework. And we've already got a lot of this pre-configured. We've done the sign up for, our, for Azure. Uh, all we have to do is start uh, the publish wizard inside of Visual Studio by right-clicking on the project and clicking publish. We then select Azure. It wants me to re-enter. That's fine. There. OK, much better. So there's my subscription. I have a resource group. I'm going to publish it to an existing uh, web app that I already defined in Azure. And the wizard then adds a few more details about um, uh, where the bot's going to go, um, what kind of configuration I want when, it, when the code's going to be available, and I'll click Publish. And in the background, uh, Visual Studio is compiling my project and uploading it and making my bot available online. Uh, now, having our bot online is great, but we actually need to register it with the bot framework so that users can talk with it. So as this publishes, I'm going to open up the bot framework. Oh, actually opened up the bot web page for me, so that's good. We can see that that's going to be live here in a second. But then I'll just navigate to dev.botframework.com, which is our developer portal in the Microsoft bot framework. I should be signed in already. This is good. Um, and you can see that there's a list of bots. Here's the Domino's Pizza bot that I demoed earlier. But we're going to register a new bot. So we're going to register a bot. We'll call it the stock bot. Uh, we'll give it a description. This is not a bot that's going to hawk your stocks. We'll give it our endpoint, which is secured by HTTPS. API slash messages. Um, Dan and Mike with this. Uh, we have our privacy URL here so that our users know uh, how my bot is going to retain data, which in this case it doesn't. Um, we have fields where we can add a telemetry key if we have that available, um, add in the bot website, which we are not, we're going to leave that blank for now. Um, and here are some options where we can have our bot translate uh, all messages, which we'll leave enabled if, in case someone wants to talk in a language other than English, um, publish in the bot directory, with, which we'll just leave false. So we'll give this an ID. We'll see if. We'll call it uh, build a stock bot. So I, I doubt that ID is taken. And then click register. We'll see. We'll see if anyone has beat me to that ID in the last 30 seconds. No, they haven't. All right, so our, our, our bot has been created, and it's now registered with the bot framework. Now, um, I'm going to call your attention to the panel on the left here. Um, you remember earlier in our web config, we had slots for an app ID and app secret. And here's where you get that information. Here's the app ID, which we chose earlier. And then here's our app secret, um, which we'll copy and paste in a minute. Um, and then we have a few settings that we set. Uh, and then down here on the left, we have a panel where we can actually test the connection to our bot. And I can tell you right now that this is going to fail because I'm gonna, my, the bot framework is going to authorize itself to our bot using different app ID and app secret than what we have configured. So uh, it'll take a second for the site to spool up, but this will very likely give me a, uh, a permissions error. I don't even think I'm going to wait for that to come back, because I know it's going to fail. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to take the app ID and app secret. So we have built a stock bot, and here's our app secret. Um, as a developer, you would usually keep this to yourself. We'll keep this to ourselves, you and me, Mike, and everyone in the room, <laughs> and streaming online. If anyone wants to impersonate our stock bot, those are the credentials. I guarantee we'll, be, we'll take those down once we're done. Build a stock bot. And we'll paste in our app secret. And then we will publish our bot again with these new settings. And this will take a second, but once our bot is online, it will be ready to accept messages uh, from, the, um, from the, the bot framework. So let me try that again. And we'll send it a test message just to make sure it's working. Um, as the service gets spooled up, uh, we'll talk about the, uh, the pane on the right. So on the right-hand side of the dashboard, you can see all of the channels where you can connect your bot. Uh, you can connect your bot to services, like I mentioned before, Skype, Slack, SMS, um, Telegram, GroupMe. Um, in this example, we're going to show you Slack. 
Uh, now, all of our channels are a bring your own account model. So you sign up for each of these services on your own, you take your username and password for them, and you give them to the bot framework, which stores them encrypted. Um, but it allows us to communicate on behalf of your bot. Now, what that means is that if you already have an account for your bot, you can just bring it in. You don't have to register a new one. And later on, if you want to take control of that account again, it's yours, and you just have to deauthorize it from the bot framework developer portal. Let's get the process started. I'm going to click on Add, and the bot framework gives us all of the steps to add our, our bot to Slack. So we open up the first slider here, and it says, go to this thing in Slack. And we're going to give it a set of names here. Slack wants a pretty good description. So we'll put in some descriptions. Um, and at this point, we have a few fields that uh, we're going to need some help with. Now, the bot framework actually gives us these fields. It says in the redirect URI, uh, we'd like to copy the text from below. So we'll copy that and paste it in over here. And uh, I've done this a few times already, so I know we just click the Create Application button. And now, going into the next section, to scroll down to the page and click Add a Bot User. So we'll do that. So you can see the screenshot matches here. It's easy to find. We will call it Stockbot. We'll click Add Bot User. And then it says, Scroll back up to the top and copy and paste these values into the bot framework. There we go. There's that. And we'll click Submit. Now, in the background, um, the bot framework is uh, submitting our application. Uh, it's submitting our credentials to Slack so that we can verify them. We'll make sure that your bot can actually communicate with Slack before we uh, light it up for your bot. So we're going to put this in the Stockbot Rocks channel. Oh, it already has one in there. We'll just put it in general. We'll click Authorize. You notice I may have, may have tried this out uh, last night, so we already have a stock bot in there, but that's OK. We'll add it in a stock bot, too. And at this point, uh, the bot framework has been able to, to successfully communicate with Slack. It's added it to a channel, and it's all ready to go. And so uh, we just uh, go back to the bot framework. We say, I'm done configuring Slack. And now Slack has been added on our list of channels. Uh, this button right here is a Slack, add to Slack button that I can now copy out of our developer portal and put uh, on my own web page if I'd like. But let's actually try it out in Slack. Uh, we'll go to build, build a bot at Slack, build a bot at build. And it's in general, and so there we have Stockbot. So we may have to invite our bot in. So it's Stockbot 2. We'll say, and so we will invite them to join. How is Microsoft doing? And we'll see, and we'll go over here and make sure that actually our test message worked. So our test message worked fine. We'll try it one more time here. Well, we may be under a lot of load today, but that's all right. Um, once you actually add your bot to Slack, you can communicate with it there. And you can add it to other channels, like you can see on the left, Skype, SMS, and others. Um, now, at this point, we've connected our bot up to users. And so I'm going to hand it back off to Mike. And Mike is going to tell you all about how to add dialog smarts to our bot. Great. Thanks, Dan. OK, so what we've seen so far is handling kind of bi-directional messaging inside of our, app, our bot application. But one of the things that is quite often going to happen when you're writing something like a bot application, even if you have a user that is communicating using natural language, you imagine ordering a pizza like the Domino's pizza that Dan was showing earlier during the keynote, and obviously we got the pizza right here, is that somebody may leave off some part of the order. Maybe they don't specify the size. Maybe they don't specify the delivery address. Maybe there's some pieces that are missing. right? So if you think about a mobile app or you think about a web-based application, quite often these applications will walk you as a user through a number of steps of, in effect, a form that needs to be filled in and have various fields completed in order for that order to be complete. right? So if we then think about mixing natural language processing to pull out all of the entities required for ordering something like a pizza, it could well be that some of those fields are missing, in which case you know, we can actually prompt the user as part of a dialogue or form model 
for them to fill in the remaining parts of that form in order for that dialog to be complete. Okay, so one thing that I need to do, obviously, since Dan has now modified the, uh, the keys for this application, is get the app ID out of the web config, go to the emulator and paste that app ID in and also grab the um, uh, app secret and go to the emulator and uh, replace that as well. Okay, good. So now when we make changes to our bot, uh, it should still be able to communicate to, uh, through the emulator to the bot. Right, so now what I'm gonna do is add a new class into the application, add class. I'm gonna call this stock. And what I'm going to do is now paste in some code or very quickly type some code, uh, which is going to provide, in effect, the outline of this form that we're gonna have the user fill in. So for uh, buying or selling stock, we probably want the stock ticker, right? Um, we want to determine whether the user wants to buy or sell. We want to determine how many shares and the date or time that the user wants to buy or sell those shares. You'll notice that I've got form builder with the red squiggly underneath it, which means something's missing. So what I need to do is add an additional NuGet package to the, uh, to the application, which is called Microsoft Bot Builder. And this is a NuGet package that brings in support for forms and dialogues into your application. Now, one of the things that we'll see when we go back to the code is there are two parts to uh, adding the form support in. The first part inside of our stock application, a stock class, is to define the form. And that comes in two stages. The first of which is the fields that we see down here, stock ticker, buy, sell, number of shares, and order date. The second part is to generate the form and return it back to the dialogue handler inside of our application. So if, you, if you're familiar with, say, GDI programming, creating a dialogue and then having the resources for that dialogue, two separate pieces, right? So in effect, it's the same model here. You define your form and then you build the form and return it back to the dialogue handler. So here is the piece of code inside of our class that uh, generates the form and returns it back. There are a couple of things that we want to point out. The first of which is when a user first connects to the bot using form filling, we'll return a message back to the user. This dot add remaining fields, you notice there's nothing before it apart from the welcome message. We'll actually see that change in a second. But in effect, what's happening is we're adding all of these fields into the form, and then we say build the form. So we're gonna come back to this class in just a second, but what I'm gonna do first is grab all of the code that sits here all the way through to handle system message, and I'm gonna replace that with a piece of code that obviously looks a lot simpler than the Lewis code that we had before. I need to add in a couple of additional usings here as well, and here as well. So this is where the, the dialogue comes in, right? So this dialogue is, is you know, form dialogue from form and then the stock order, order make form. So that's where the form information gets built into the dialogue and then the dialogue is handled with the user. So what I'm gonna do is build that, run that, and again, we should see the standard web page being uh, displayed. And now if I come back to the emulator, because we've changed the app ID and app secret, I should now be able to type hello. And it says, welcome to stock bot. Please enter stock ticker, right? So now we're into the form. There are a number of things that I can type. I can tell, type help or status, uh, which shows me how much of the form is already complete. Obviously, if I add the Lewis model into this, then we could use Lewis to pull out the various pieces of the user's intent, autofill some of the fields within that form, and only prompt the user for the pieces that are missing, All right? Okay, so uh, what I'm gonna do, obviously, is put in my favorite ticker that we saw earlier, right? I'm gonna hit enter, and it seems quite happy with that. So now we appear to be missing a piece of functionality that we had before, which was the ability to call out to that Yahoo stock service, validate the stock, and then return to the user saying, this doesn't appear to be valid, or this is valid stock. The other thing that we're seeing in this conversation is if we have a look here, it says, please enter stock ticker. 
If we come back to our application and have a look in stock CS, you'll see that this is the name of the field that's on the form, right? What we might want to do is change this to provide, rather than the name of the element within the form, something more descriptive to the user. So what I'm going to do is uh, come back to this piece of code. I'm going to replace that. And the top of this is identical to what we had before. But what I'm now adding is some annotation on the various fields that are inside of this class. So you can see here there's a prompt that says, which stock ticker are you interested in? And then um, the stock ticker, do you want to buy or sell? And so on, right? So now if I build this, deploy this, again, we get the standard web page being displayed. I'm just going to close that down as well. Come back to the emulator, say hello. And now rather than the names of, oh, let me just try that again. I'm going to shut down the emulator for just a second to restart the conversation from scratch. What we'll see is when the emulator restarts and I interact with that emulator and I say hello, uh, what we should see is that uh, the, instead of the name of the field inside of the class being displayed to me, I'll actually get the full prompt for uh, what we see here inside of the uh, stock class. Okay, so let's go back and say hello. Welcome to stock bot. Which stock ticker are you interested in? Okay, so I could obviously enter something like Microsoft or I could put in my favorite stock ticker. So let's do that again, right? I'm gonna type that in, hit enter. And again, it's still really not doing anything uh, about validating that stock. I can obviously navigate within the form as well. So this has taken me from stock down to whether I want to buy or sell. And I could either type the word buy or sell, or I could add the number one or two. Uh, there's some built-in validation here. So if I try and type three, it tells me that that's not an option. If I get to a date time field and I try and enter a date time that is not valid, again, that will be validated for me as part of the form. If I want to go back and fix up that stock item, I can type back which will take me back in the form, and obviously I could correct this and put in a, a valid ticker, but we still want to be able to get to that point that I can validate the stock on the fly as the user is interacting with my form, right? <laughs> yes, I hear you say, <laughs> yeah, great. Okay, so why don't we fix that up now? What I'm gonna do is come back into the class, and I'm gonna replace this with the exact piece of code that we had before down at the bottom, right? So this is the fields that make up the form. But if we come back up, we'll notice that the piece of code that builds the form has now changed. We still start off with form builder to build the form. We have our welcome message, welcome to the stock bot. I then add one of the fields, so I can now set the order of the fields within the form, right? But rather than just adding the field, I'm also kicking into a validate function here. And in this case, I'm generating a validate result, and this has two parts to it. A is valid, true or false, so I can determine or return back into the form model that this field is now complete. We're good to move on, right? So I return true to say that this, this field within the form is, is correct. Or I can return false to say, no, that was incorrect. I now need you to re-enter some data. So this will obviously be very familiar to you. I'm calling out to the Yahoo stock service uh, with the value that the user has entered. Uh, if it's null, then I return a string saying that's not valid and set the return is valid field to false. Otherwise, if it is valid, I will return to the user saying, okay, that's valid. Here's what the stock is currently at and then move on to the next field in the form. Uh, and then we add the rest of the fields. There are a couple of other interesting things that we see here. First of all, I've added a dot .confirm. So whenever the form is filled correctly, all the fields are valid, we can then prompt a user to say, do you want to order, buy, sell so many shares in a stock you know, right now? And that will prompt the user to say yes or no that they want to continue. The other thing that we have is an on completion. And I just need to fix up this uh, debug.write line, and maybe we'll set a breakpoint here as well. So this gives you the ability, obviously, if you're writing a real bot, when somebody's filling a form, once the form is complete, 
once you know that it's complete, you probably want to kick off into your own like corporate model for initiating some kind of event or storing some data or whatever else. So this is the place that you would do that. Okay, so now let's go ahead and build that as, uh, as the bot application, deploy it. Again, we'll see the standard web page being displayed. And the next thing we want to do is go back to the emulator and say hello. Oh, well, obviously we're still in the conversation, so I'm just going to tear that down and bring the emulator back up. So what's going to happen when the emulator starts? I'm going to initiate the conversation, say hi, right? Once I say that, we'll step into the form, and the first item that we have within the form is to fill out this doc. So I can then give it, obviously, my favorite ticker, <laughs> jigger, 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 uh, and hopefully that's going to come back and say, no, that's not valid. You need to re-enter your stock, and then we can add a real stock ticker. So let's say, hello, welcome to StockBot. Which stock ticker are you interested in? So we get the uh, fuller version of the, uh, the prompt there, and I'll enter an invalid stock, and it says, this is not a valid stock ticker. So our validate function is now being hit in line within that form, right? So now if I enter a valid stock, it will say it's currently at this amount. Do you want to buy or sell? So I'll say buy some number. Or oh, what date do you want this to take place? We'll say uh, 3.30.2016, which should be a valid date. How many shares? Let's say 100. And then we get that dot confirm firing. Do you want to buy 100 shares of Microsoft on this date? So if we say yes, then at that point, our breakpoint fires in the bot. And obviously, we can do whatever we want at that point with the data that's part of that form. All right, so that's pretty neat, right? So we have just a couple of minutes remaining in this session. And what we've seen during the last 60 minutes is we've taken you through the model of file new project to get to a template for a bot application through to dealing with both user and system messages. And then on top of that, adding natural language handling through Lewis, as well as form filling and validation of items within a form inside of your bot application, right? Obviously, you can mix all of these various pieces together, a mixture of Lewis and dialogues and forms and cascading forms and prompts. There's a lot that we haven't shown you that you can obviously go to take a look at after the session. OK, great. So I, th I think we've covered a lot. Dan, anything else to say? Absolutely. You know, I mentioned earlier that the bot framework is an open platform. And you can compose any of the tools that you already have with the tools that we've shown you here, as long as they talk our message format or if you want to use our bot builder framework. Um, we have a lot that you can, you can use. Um, but, uh, uh, and, and so if you want to build your own bot, actually, if you want to use regexes, if you want to use um, your own state management um, uh, code, you can do that. Um, and it's great. You can put together you know, big stacks of regexes. Um, you, you can add all that into your own bot. Um, but I like being able to use Lewis. I like being able to use the form stuff because it, makes, it reduces so much complexity in the code. So uh, we have a few resources for you. Go to botframework.com to download the SDK, download our emulator. Um, actually use the bot connector to connect your bot up to your users. Um, we have a quick start challenge in the main hub of the, uh, of the event hall where you can use some additional tools for the bot framework. Uh, we have a Q&A maker that the folks from Bing put together where you can build a bot uh, with uh, really very little or, or almost no source code at all. Uh, you point it to a web page and it builds an interactive bot from that page. So go over there and try that out. Uh, and then there are a ton of other sessions. And in fact, I didn't have enough room. I listed three of them. There are so many more. Um, there's a session on building a Skype bot uh, directly to the, bot, the Skype SDK. Um, there's a session, another session that Mike's going to have on building smarter, and it's a very long title, smarter and more engaging <laughs> experiences with Microsoft's intelligence services, all about the machine learning and natural language processing services that you saw here and more. Um, there's a session on building your own smart, Bart, smart bot. Um, put together by some of the folks in the Cortana Intelligence Services team. So we have a lot to offer, and there's many more. Do look in, in your event guides. Um, but I, I think that's about it in terms of the content that we'd like to share with you. Uh, we'd like to open it up for questions if you have any. Um, I think, are there folks with mics? Um, I think there are a couple of mics. So if you could uh, make your way to the microphones and ask a question there so that we, we make sure we get those captured, that would be great.
Um, so my question is, uh, we saw this awesome story around machine learning as well and, and kind of that great web user interface. When are we going to be able to see that? Yeah. Um, uh, the, Lewis, um, uh, the Lewis website that we showed you is a machine learning system. And uh, if you look for sessions on Lewis, uh, I think does your session cover Lewis in more detail? Uh, we, we do at some level, yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, there are plenty of sessions on, on uh, Lewis that you can take a look at. Um, I'm happy to talk with you afterward to share more about what that is. Uh, but that tool is a machine learning tool. Mm -hmm. Yes. Is there any support for user authentication in the framework itself? In this case, you showed a stock purchase. How do we know it's really somebody that should be purchasing stock with that account? That's right. Um, a great question. Um, we don't have any built-in uh, user authentication at the moment, so we pass you the information that we have received from the channel, like SMS or Skype, um, so you have that identity. But if you want to authenticate the user, you could build a link to have them log in um, or uh, find some other way to authenticate the user. Good. A book. Hey, hello. Oh, <laughs> yeah, how about we do it inside, yes? Um, is it possible to framework? Um, the user can then initiate a dialogue, set up the alarm, and there's a uh, method call, which we haven't shown here, uh, which your bot can send to the connector uh, to initiate an out-of-band uh, message. Perfect. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Could you, could you tell me about the multi-language support? Oh, over there. Yeah. I didn't even yeah. notice there's another mic. So sorry, yeah. yes. Can you, can you repeat your uh, question? Yeah, multi-language support. Do you have any plan to support non-English language? Ah. Um, if you use our translation features, yep. um, you know, I, I actually, uh, the, uh, the product is brand new, and I don't know that we've tried it with a non-English bot, um, but since we do support Bing's translation service built into the service, it, it would be a great thing for you to try out. Okay. The, the other thing to say is that tomorrow at 5 o'clock, we have a session that uh, partly covers the both text and voice translation features. How about this one? Um, I have a quick question. So, of course, it should be connected to the internet, but, but should it be also hosted on the internet? Could it be hosted on-premise, but connected to the internet? At the moment, the bot does have to have a webhook call that's accessible. Now, you can secure that call with HTTPS and the app ID and app secret that we showed you, but the, uh, the service interface for your bot has to be available on the internet at the moment. OK, thanks. Yeah. Over here. Hey, I got a two-part question for you. So first part you might have already addressed, but I came a bit late. I'm curious about the bot framework itself is open source. Um, what's the licensing and governance of, about it, and how do I contribute? Uh, is my first part. Yeah, um, half of the bot builder, or sorry, half of the bot framework is open source. The bot builder parts. It's available on GitHub. Um, I haven't looked at the license recently. You should take a look at it there. I, okay. I don't want to answer without having a really clear idea in my mind of what it is. No worries. But okay. all the information is available on GitHub. That's great. OK, so that's just the builder, but the actual bot stuff itself is deployed and run on your premise? Or like, how's the distribution part work? Yes, uh, so the bot connector is deployed in Azure. OK. Uh, and that's a service that we uh, maintain and operate, uh, and we have the source code for. Um, and then the bot builder is code on GitHub that you can put in your own bot. Got it. OK, mm -hmm. great. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Over here. Um, so if, if I had a mobile app that I wanted to have as a front end for a chat bot, um, would I be doing that through the connector or would I be doing that like directly messaging the API itself? Oh, this is a fantastic question. It's almost like you're a plant. This is great. I know I, you're not. <laughs> I am um, not but a plant. That, that's fantastic. Um, so we actually have, so you saw our many channels, right, where you can connect to users, SMS, uh, Skype, others. Um, we have a, a, an API called, uh, a channel called direct line, which is a direct line from your application or your website directly to your bot. Um, so to use your bot within a mobile application, uh, you would host your bot in the bot connector, and then you would use the direct line client, which is available also as a node.js and C-sharp proxy, um, to call from your mobile app into the, the front side of the connector, if you will, right? the side that, where all the channels are. Um, and so you, your mobile app would be a peer of Skype and SMS and Slack and others. Does that make sense? Yes. And so is that uh, client library, um, the C-sharp one, is it a portable class library? Can it be used in a Xamarin application? Uh, I actually don't know whether it's a portable class library. I'll, I will follow up on that. It, it, um, all of our C Sharp libraries are available on NuGet. So if you take a look there, you'll be able to answer for yourself pretty quickly. Okay. But I'll look into that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I think last question. Yeah, let, last question over here. Oh, well, I hope it's a good one. Um, right. <laughs> well, it was a bit late, but in terms of deployment, if I had a third party assembly that I wanted to attach into my bot and deploy it out there, it'll just do an automatic NuGet restore for me. 
Um, so uh, the automatic NuGet restore at build time is um, something that Visual Studio and MS Build already do. Yes. I'm not really part of the bot framework, so we don't actually host your assembly at all. Um, you take your code and you put it on your own server, and if you want to do automatic NuGet package restore yes. on build when you push your, your service to the cloud, Correct. totally, you can, you can do that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you all so much for sticking around. There's a couple slices of cold pizza if you'd like any.